being awarded. Item C, this will be approval agenda. So this is the approved agenda for December 13th being today, 2021, regular planning commission meeting. Motion. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. This is item D, citizens comments. So at this point, we'll allow citizens to comment on any agenda item they wish. You are only allowed three minutes. Please leave your questions as comments if you have any additional comments or questions and you don't feel like they're answered during the presentation of the agenda item, feel free to come up to me after the meeting. Uh, each guest is welcome to comment, but they must state their first and last name and where they reside. So at this point, Mr. Chair, if you'd like to open up citizens comments. Open up this to citizens comments, please. All right, anybody, feel free. You going to start? Not everybody get up at once. Uh, Mr. Van Amberg, uh, members of the Goddard Planning Commission and city administrators, my name is Curtis Kidwell, and I live at 21101 West 23rd Street South, just to the south of the proposed annexation with my wife, Allison. For the record, I would like to state that I'm not opposed to progress or the need for the city of Goddard to expand, but I am opposed to the proposed annexation at the corner of 215th Street West and 23rd Street South and the rezoning to R2. I uh, had prepared a six page statement that you're with graphs and Excel spreadsheets that I would like to share with you. It kind of gives a little more information as to what brings me to my position tonight. Um, but let's remember your mission, charter, zoning, regulations state that you look out for the public interest and the safety. Even in the invocation, we talk about what's best for the public interest. Um, so let's talk about safety. My prepared statement goes into depth as to how safety is affected in the realms of increased traffic by our schools, parks and trails, crime, flooding, especially flooding. My statement shows that the floodplain a uh, spreadsheet looking at just the runoff and gallons of water from the, just the rooftops, not counting the other impermeable surfaces. Uh, also from your mission statement, uh, you declare that uh, development should be visually appealing. Let's talk about Cloverleaf Farms North of Ace Hardware for a minute. Uh, talking to people around town, I have yet to hear someone describe that development as visually appealing. I have, however, heard things like row houses and Goddard's Plain View development. With the number of houses and duplexes in this proposed annexation, uh, I'm afraid and fearful that the development will look just as visually unappealing. I challenge the Planning Commission and the City Council and the City Administrators to promote some high-end housing within the city limits. I believe that it is very short-sighted of the community development uh, process to not have a housing development of large lots and high-end houses. Mays and Andover have fixed this the issue. Even Garden Plain has Larry Stecklein's Pretty Flowers Estate Edition. Um, this area would be better suited to that kind of development. Uh, once again, let's talk to the mission statement, let's talk about economic sustainability. In January, the city was carrying $22 million in debt and approved a $2.8 million deficit budget. But yet the city council meeting last November 15th somehow approved $100,000 to give to the ICT developers uh, for water line installation in the proposed annexation. How is this fiscally uh, responsible and sustainable? Let's not forget the impact to our schools and overcrowding uh, and once again flooding uh, disastrously affect on the economic sustainability. And finally, let's talk about public feedback and protecting the larger public interest. Uh, so let's talk a minute about 
Um, exactly a minute, please. <laughs> Um, our, found, our government is founded on these self-evident truths, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men uh, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Thomas Jefferson, Declaration of Independence. Said another way, this commission, the city council, and elected officials in this community derive their powers from the consent of the people they represent. Remember that the people living in the community and their needs and wishes come before the developers living outside of the community and the limited liability companies form to earn a profit for themselves. Neither of these entities have the best interest of the community and the people living here. And in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, I do not give my consent to this development. Thank you. My name is Diane Hilburn. I live at 2450 South 208th, also just south of the proposed developed area. In 2017, a similar proposal came forward to this council asking for a rezoning of that same area and the, the community as a whole came back and present, presented petitions to you saying there were a lot of issues with that proposal. Curtis has said some of those. There's an impact on flooding. That is a flood zone. And if the contractor, the developer does not do an adequate job, there will be individuals in that neighborhood that will be flooded. Curtis being one of the most impacted. Last time we talked about the traffic on 23rd Street. Not only are we now dealing with going to have increased traffic on 23rd, but now you're going to put it on 215 as well, which is a, a road that has 60 mile hour traffic. And unless the county turns around and re changes the mileage, you're going to have kids trying to go to school on that road. It's a very hazardous situation. So you said you agreed with us in 2017 that there were issues. Those issues still exist. Now we, in addition, we're going to populate the school. The response of the city to us when we talked about the fact that the schools are already somewhat quite crowded was, well, they'll just have to go build more schools. Well, have you talked with the schools? No, we haven't talked with the schools yet. That's their problem. They'll just have to do a, a proposal to the community to raise funds. Well, what happens if the community says, no more Goddard, High, Goddard schools. We've paid enough for you to have schools. So we've got that. Now we also have a post office which we didn't even deal with last time, that is overwhelmed and cannot handle the volume that's already in this community. And yet we're going to go and ask to have a new development that's rezoned to allow somebody to bring in multi-purpose homes. Like Curtis, I'm not opposed, nor is my husband Steve, opposed to having a development in that area. But it should be more of a high-end area because high-end development because you have high-end houses that are on 5, 10, and 15 acres sitting <coughs> right next to that development. And you're wanting to go stick in 100 to 40, 180 homes, multifamily plus single family, to to work with that whole neighborhood. It doesn't, it's not aesthetically pleasing, and like he, Curtis mentioned Cur and Garden Plain, Andover, Mays, they are working to have a better plan on how they bring in their community. We were told one of the reasons why they want, the city wants this development is because people want to live in Goddard because of the school system. Well, at some point in time, if the school system can't handle the volume there will be a point in time where people aren't going to want to live in Goddard anymore because of the school system. It's no different that people used to want to live in Wichita. They don't anymore because of the school system. So I, I am 
adamantly opposed to the rezoning of that property, as is my husband. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Phil Boston, it's B-O-S-T-I-A-N, and I live at 2525 South, 222nd West, which would be just southwest of this development. Uh, I know enough about zoning and the 17 factors that those are the things we really need to address. And so I specifically want to talk to number six and uh, number 15 and number 17. Specifically, I'm addressing the issue with traffic safety. That's the thing that I'm probably the most concerned about. Number six asks about, uh, are there streets that, uh, do street, does street access exist or can they be provided? So can it be provided or does it exist? In my opinion, no, but that, it, that comes back to the definition of do the streets exist or is there access to the streets? Uh, this area, as you know, is served by county and township roads and also by U.S. Highway 54. I remember when 215th and 23rd Street uh, were paved. They were paved with a cold rolled asphalt uh, process and the road base was very poor. Since that time, 215th has been redone several times and has been improved to an adequate level. Although the shoulders drop off, as you know, it's very, uh, very steep and if you drop a tire off one side, uh, it's very bad. 23rd, however, has only had a thin layer placed on it. And if you drive down 23rd, you can see the difference. There's a gigantic hole that keeps reappearing uh, just several blocks east of 215th and it gets refilled and it reappears. And plus you can see the ruts that are there, all which indicate that the road base is not adequate. <coughs> Above all, though, my greatest concern is the intersection of uh, U.S. Highway 54 and 215th. I think most of us in this room probably negotiate that intersection on a regular basis. The amount of traffic that goes through there continues to increase, and as we all know, the Dillon's Warehouse is there, and we have heavy uh, truck traffic that comes in and out there on a regular basis. There's a severe problem with traffic at that intersection. I've seen many, many wrecks that I've driven through the intersection and seen the aftermath. As you know, the shoulders there are gravel and they've been posted no parking by both the city of Goddard and by the county. Uh, a lot of signs were posted for no parking. A lot of them have been run over and smashed or knocked down by all the trucks that park on top, ironically, that park on the no parking signs. They park on both sides all the way up to the intersection. And when traffic comes along and tries to turn down that road, if you have traffic stopped northbound on 215th, you have semis trying to make a right turn after the shoulder was turned into a right turn lane. There's an inadequate radius for them to make that turn without swinging clear over into the, to the left-hand lane. So just recently I've seen the standoff at that intersection. You have trucks trying to turn in from both directions and you have traffic on 215th that's trying to cross and nobody can make a move. So my question is, what is the plan or does the developer have a plan or does the city have a plan to address the existing traffic problem at 215th and US 54? If not, the addition of all of this housing and additional residents is going to do nothing but exacerbate an existing problem. I have no idea whether there is an existing plan, but <clears throat> my guess is that the developer probably has not addressed this issue because it's far enough away. Right now, we know the traffic from the southwest, or the southwest part of Goddard, a lot of those folks go to 215th to get on US 54 because it's closer and it's easier than going down to 199th. And I'm sure that's what's going to happen with the traffic from this development. So. On the basis of safety alone, I would ask that this commission would reconsider this request to rezone this area. I also think we should not uh, give the developer the opportunity to get a blanket uh, conditional use permit because as they add each additional uh, housing unit, that's going to create another impact. So I think the developer should have to come back for each housing unit and ask for a conditional use permit rather than a blanket elimination like they're asking for. 
So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Cody Branham. I'm a local real estate attorney, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Terry and Janet Driscoll. They reside at 21025, 21025 West 23rd Street, located approximately southeast of this uh, proposed rezoning. Uh, Terry and Janet, in their regards, they wish they could be here tonight, but they're out of town on work commitments, and so I'm here to express some of their concerns uh, with this proposal, a lot of which has uh, you've heard already tonight in terms of uh, issues that will just naturally arise because of the increased population density that this development uh, uh, would cause. Uh, you've already heard concerns tonight about increased traffic uh, and the increased roadway maintenance that would be required to support that level of uh, traffic uh, and safety concerns. You've also heard about flooding concerns tonight. Uh, another item that I know the Driscolls are concerned with that hasn't yet been addressed tonight is the fact that with these multifamily housings, you're going majority of those folks are going to be leasing the property, right? Uh, and it's not to say that you know tenants are undesirable or anything like that, but the concern is they may not have the level of buy-in or commitment to keeping the neighborhood well maintained that someone who owns the property uh, and would be a long-term resident may share. Uh, they're concerned uh, in terms of. You know, how are we going to ensure that the property is being well maintained? I, I have no doubt that the, the proposed developer has good intentions with this development, but there's nothing restricting the proposed developer from selling it to a slumlord in five years. Then you have a huge problem on your hands in terms of just the sheer number of people living there and the maintenance. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, a proposal for the same property uh, to make it multifamily housing was uh, considered in 2017 and ultimately denied by the City Council. I thought looking in those minutes from 2017, the City Council did a great job of, you know, uh, listening and considering the concerns of their citizens and really acting on behalf of their citizens. And so I would just urge you to do the same tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. How's it going? Uh, my name is Ed Cropper. I live at 2700 South 222nd Street West. Uh, just echoing some of the previous concerns with uh, flooding, also the traffic. Uh, and at the same time, I would like to see where the council would start looking to developers or entertaining developers that are wanting to bring up homes that would include or that the, uh, the employees are largest employer in the, the city would use. Uh, 265 has lots of teachers. They don't have a place to live because our homes, fortunately for a lot of the homeowners, are, are up, up, upwards of 200,000 plus. Uh, I don't know how many beginning teachers are, are able to afford a $200,000 home, but I doubt it's in Goddard. Something to consider there. Uh, floodways, you know, we talked about that and we talked about traffic. Something that uh, they brought up to me earlier uh, when we were going around with the petition was putting stuff off to the county. Uh, I don't think that we should really look at the county expecting somebody else to do our job for us. We need to make sure that we're looking at who's, what's happening afterwards. If they've developed this town or this area, county, sure, they're in charge of floodway. What's their plan gonna be? Same thing with the traffic. Uh, 215 is pretty dangerous, trying to cross Kellogg's. That's it's a crap shoot and it doesn't often, doesn't win all the time. Um, plenty of traffic coming out of the Dillon's warehouse. Just ask you guys to look forward to that too. Just look at the other things coming down the besides another developer bringing in the neighborhood. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Glenn Ming. I, uh, <coughs> I live at 2011 South here at 15th Street West. I'm probably the only property on the west side of 215th Street there, right next to the trail. I, I just want to kind of give you a visual. We've lived there for 26 years. and two different times, we've seen water, this would be on the northwest corner of the property there, uh, come across 215th Street. So I know a lot of folks here are talking about the flooding, maybe going to, this, to the south, but it also goes to the west also. 
and it, it's a big ditch over there if you, I don't know if you guys have been by it or not, but going across that road is a lot of water. Uh, so I think the only way they're gonna help that it's, the issue is probably putting in a larger culvert or something under 215th Street. I don't know if the county's gonna be willing to come up with that or not, I, I'm just saying. I guess the other thing is when, when, when we all build out there, we kind of, <coughs> we kind of trust that everyone's word's going to be kept and at the time probably none of you were in on the commission time i'm sure but you know in a single family that's kind of what we expect and we just kind of hope you guys keep your word to that or keep the city's word to that uh keep it that way because it's it's, it's nice property and uh i think a lot of people would would like to build nice homes there that's all i got thank you Good evening. Uh, appreciate you guys letting me speak this evening. Uh, my name is Mark Lewis. I live at 416 Richard Road uh, on the corner of Walnut and Richard, uh, just right across the street from the Clark Davidson Elementary School. And uh, I would just like to echo the concerns of safety regarding that road in particular, as well as 23rd. And the amount, my, my concern largely is the amount of traffic that that will generate, that having 40 to 50 duplexes, so that's 80 units uh, or 100 units. Uh, so we're talking about somewhere between 100 and 200 additional vehicles traveling up and down 215 as well as up and down Walnut trying to get kids to school. Uh, that road, both of those roads are really quite busy <coughs> already and I have uh, dire concerns about safety and just traffic in general. Uh, additionally, this is the community that you, that this impacts uh, all the citizens that are here this evening this is this is who this impacts um, and we're I think I can probably speak for everybody here that we are all opposed to the proposed development for multifamily housing single-family housing I think would be sufficient I think that that would be great for our community in this area but I, I just don't believe that multifamily housing is is in the best interest of this community in this community this citizenry in this area please don't please don't do this to our community thank you very much for your time uh, my name is chris curry 2600 south 222nd street west um, i've heard several of the individuals here mention concerns about traffic on 215th and on 23rd Street. Um, I want to make sure that everyone here is aware that maintenance of 23rd Street from Market, I believe it is, where Clark Davidson is, to 215th Street is not the responsibility of the city, nor is it the responsibility of the county. It is the township, mm -hmm. and the township does not have the ability to maintain that road as is evident with that large pothole um, that I called on that back in August, September of last year, called the city first. They put me in contact with the county and the county said, no, that's the city's. I finally found out that it was the township that is responsible for maintaining that road. It is evident that they don't have the ability to even fill in a pothole adequately and to put that additional traffic on 23rd Street. There's no way that the township is going to be able to maintain that road to a safe level for all those additional vehicles. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for hearing us speak tonight. Uh, my name is Amanda Hudson. I live at 21901 West 23rd Street South. So as they were explaining before, the flooding is definitely going to affect, you know, with uh, the additional water distribution 
it does affect further west. Right now, um, our property borders where the bridge is on 23rd Street and where it runs, um, it runs just west of the property. Right now, since the Dillon's Distribution Center went in, we saw an increase in water runoff. Uh, we struggle right now as it is with that amount of water. Something was supposed to be done, it didn't get done, but we're managing as we are. They've done um, the township as best they can to go in and they dig out the ditch right there on the north side of the, of the bridge that crosses 23rd Street. It's not uncommon at all for that water to go completely over the bridge when we get heavy rains. All of that is funneled down Afton Creekway and I know dumps into the backyard. I don't know who's, yeah, into their backyard. And it is incredibly close to their home right now as it stands with the water distribution. We're terrified of what's gonna happen when we pave and roof that much terrain that close by. So please take into consideration that the builders, the city, and the county all need to really take this into consideration. We're talking about our lives. This is where we live. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anyone else? One more. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kurt Johnson, and my wife Teresa. We live at 21405 West 23rd Street South. It's directly south of uh, this activity. We've been there for 23 years, and, and we really enjoyed the view out there, that nice open field, you know. But we understand progress is <coughs> uh, working its way towards us. And uh, but I do want to reiterate what everyone else said about flooding. Uh, I've seen water roll out of that one field uh, from the north of us down into the ditch and down in the culverts in between us and Kidwells and there's a 15 foot rooster tail coming out of that tube on the other side and it's just uh, scary sometimes and if the engineer doesn't do his job properly with those, those retaining uh, lakes and ponds there's going to be a big issue and, and like they've said before uh, it did a real good job of, of iterating how, how important that is to us. The other thing I haven't heard is that uh, traffic is the main concern. Traffic. Uh, our front window looks out 23rd Street, and I can't tell you how many semis I'm seeing coming down 23rd Street now for some reason. Whether they don't want to turn left on uh, 215 and, and go to left on Kellogg or whatever, but they're coming down 23rd Street. And that pothole, that's just, you know, that's right where the water, you know, comes across the low, one of the lowest areas in that area, and all those trucks. They're just making it worse, and like they said, they're just throwing rocks in it, and it just, it just it's not a fix. You get, they have to get down to the, the bed somewhere down below three inches to fix that whole thing. So, so okay, so there's, there's two accesses on 215, and one that's on 23rd Street. And since that'll be a uh, city now, uh, all those houses, if they have kids, they're not gonna be bused. The, your parents have to take them to the schools so if all the schools start at the same time, that's a lot of traffic coming out of that one hole on 23rd Street because they're not going to want to go on uh, 215 because of the trucks and uh, turning left. I, I, there's not even a, a way to get around those trucks, you know, to turn right if they want to turn right. So I got to wait for these guys, maybe, you know, 10 minutes sometimes, waiting for a nice hole so they can get out and turn left to go to Hutchinson. And it's just, uh, it's, guys, we're living every day and it's just uh it's not easy we understand that goddard needs more housing the the uh one single resident versus double resident single resident i really don't have that much issue with the double why can't we have an area just for doubles you know that that area behind ace seems like there's a lot of uh, duplexes back there why can't you just keep them segregated like that it's already been approved. Everyone's already used, used that idea of having those kind of houses there. Uh, the people that would live in that area, uh, uh, that own their own houses, would see an influx of people coming in and out all the time. You just get to know them while they're moving out, just get new people moving out. It's just, there's probably no ownership in taking care of the house because it's not yours. You know, it just, 
<clears throat> that would fall on the landowner and uh, the property owner. And if he owns a lot of land, that can get expensive maintaining all that. So, you know, it just uh, we we prefer just the single dwelling homes in that area. Plus the other safety concerns we we talked about. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Anyone else want to speak at this time? I think we've got at least one more. One more. Oh. <laughs> um, good evening. My name is Tracy Latham, and I live at that corner, okay? You don't know how many times I've seen people almost killed. They end up in my front yard. It's frustrating because they don't stop. And so the safety is huge. I still have tire marks from last spring. Trucks park right next to our house, next to our trees on the dirt road. And they sit there and they will park because they have no place else to park. We've had people do drug deals or meet somebody beside our trees because it's a nice blocked dirt road. So I think that when we are bringing these issues, I think water, as everybody has said, but the safety is huge because the number of people that drive the road has increased immensely in the 23 years that we've lived there. Sorry, my address is 2415 Thank South 215. I apologize. So we're the house on that corner. We're the ones that see those people drive by every single time. And the concern is the increase of traffic and the fact that, you know, where's the entrance going to be placed? You know, what is the idea that they're ready to go there? We get that. But the water is really bad. And so um, our main thing, though, is the safety because we witness it, we watch it, and we watch people have accidents at that corner. So those are some major things there. So we just hope that you'll take all of the things that were said tonight into consideration and um, just really double think some of the decisions that might come about. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak or move up one more? Hi, my name is Bob Merritt. I live at 2501 South 222nd Street West, which would be uh, Caddy Corner, south and west of the property, I think, that's uh, in question. Uh, my perspective is probably a little bit different. Um, I took up residence there in May of 2010, been very happy to live in that, that neighborhood, and uh, have, have actually served uh, the Goddard community as a school board member for almost 10 years. I was on from uh, 2011 until 2020. Uh, some say I got out just in time. Uh, I, I, my last uh, my last meeting was January of 2020. Uh, but uh, most like you, I'm very concerned about the community and the investment. So my comments tonight are simply about <clears throat> the perspective of a long-term uh, investment for that property for the community and how it might benefit uh, the community a, as a whole if it were uh, single-family dwellings. So I lived in Bartlett, Tennessee for 18 years. Um, had originally lived in Sedgwick County and had taught at Mulvane High School for six years. And then I went into private education for 20 years and that corporation moved me to Tennessee. The neighborhood we lived in in Bartlett was adjacent to the Memphis, Tennessee community. And so they were very concerned about schools, about the type of neighborhoods they had and uh, intrusion from the city. And I don't think that's that's a problem. I think in this case, you could have a positive impact on the community by limiting it to single family dwellings. Uh, because this is already uh, a destination town. Uh, a a uh, home in Goddard will sell to almost the first person that walks through it. And so there won't be a problem with filling that area as much as the developer wants to fill 
with single family dwellings, and I think that will bode well for the community overall, more so than, say, uh, the load on the school district that a greater number of uh, uh, apartment uh, complexes or a greater number of families back in a smaller area would be. So I would ask that you consider the impact it had on Bartlett. They were uh, remarkably successful, sold out every neighborhood they had, um, all the single family dwellings and uh, it was a great boon for the community and people wanted to move there rather than somewhere else. So uh, think of the long-term impact as you make this vote. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right, I like it. <clears throat> you close this portion of citizen comments? I'd like to close citizen comments. <coughs> Thank you. Very good. All right, as mentioned, if anyone has any follow-up questions from the agenda items, feel free to meet me after or in my office. It's open from 8 to 4.30. So we're going to go on to item E. This is approval of the minutes. So this is to approve the Planning Commission of regular meeting minutes from November 8, 2021. Um, as a refresher, we had a special use application for the restaurant bar at 401 Industrial and the conversion of an accessory to a principal building. I'll make a motion to approve second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. So this is item F. This is the Board of Zoning Appeal. So this is item F1. So this is a conditional use permit for the carport. This is case number CUP-21-1. Quick background. Uh, Eugene and Darlene Pauls Meyer submitted an application for a conditional use permit, a CUP, to add a carport to the property that exceeds that exceeds 400 square feet. The current subdivision regulations state that the carport cannot exceed 400 square feet unless the conditional use permit has been approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals for a larger structure. Uh, key SCUP requires publication city newspaper in 20 days elapsed before they can be considered by the BZA. A CUP also requires letters to be sent out to everyone within 200 feet of the property within city limits and 1,000 feet outside city limits. Uh, according to Article 6, 100 point B of subdivision regulations permitted accessory uses, and you can read it from here. But basically jumping down to the orange part, which is the fun part, it says 400 square feet for a carport unless the conditional use is approved. So this is where we get the idea that if you exceed <coughs> 400 square feet on a carport, you're going to have to ask for a conditional use permit, very similar to what we have for our detached garages. If they exceed 720, and then, but now 1440, then you would have to pull a conditional use permit. Very same for the carport. So the Board of Zoning Appeals is considering approving a carport that exceeds the maximum 400 square feet. The property owners are asking for 800 square feet. The request will put the carport inside and setback on the east side, which will have to be considered with a following variance request, which will be the second follow-up item. The request does not exceed the maximum lot coverage of 35%. The request puts the lot coverage at 18%. The property is located at 427 West 3rd Avenue. And there's the property. The blue line is the property limits. The proposed carport would be somewhere around there, not the scale, not the scale, just an example. This is some um, examples of what the carport would look like traditional carport. Small publication cost per state law and approved as to form. It is the recommendation that the Planning Commission approve the CUP for the carport subject to review the variance requests as to follow up to accompany the CUP request simply because the carport <coughs> would extend into the setback on the east side. So the second agenda item following this one, if this one is approved, would be to consider the variance for the setback. But at this point, we would invite Dar uh, Darling or Eugene Baltimore, if you wish. I don't know where you guys are. I'll be right there. Right. Yeah. You want to come speak on the item? And any questions, feel free. Good evening. I'm Gene Paul Smyre, my wife Darlene. We're looking to put a carport in our backyard, get a couple of trailers out of the Kansas weather, a little further from the street, and I would entertain any questions you might have. Are the, where are the trailers? Are they currently stored on your property? Yes. Or you them yes, they're on my property at the moment. The way we require. I don't have any questions either. Thank you very much. Okay. I believe Mike has prepared this extensively. <laughs> so <laughs>
favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. So this will be the follow-up item, the setback variance request for the carport. So as mentioned, Eugene and Arlene Paul's Meyer submitted an application for a variance to add a carport to the property that encroaches on the side yard setback of the property. The current subdivision regulations state that a variance can be used in specific cases and with certain findings of fact can be used in the consideration process. A variance can be used to vary that full minimum yard um, setback requirements. The request would reduce the setback to the east as necessary to allow for the carport to occupy all of that portion of the east side yard between the detached garage and the fence. A variance request publica requires publication in the city newspaper in 20 days elapsed before they can be considered by the BZA, which is the Board of Zoning Appeals. A variance requires letters to be sent out to everyone within 200 feet of the property within city limits and 1,000 feet outside city limits. So variance is a little bit different. Obviously, conditional use permits follow certain state law requirements and subdivision requirements locally. Variances are very similar in that, but they have different provisions that have to be taken into account. So Article 10-107.C authorizes certain variances of what can be considered for a variance. Obviously, if they said they wanted to build a carport in the street, that wouldn't be allowed as a variance. And so in this particular case, they're asking for it to be built on their property just to encroach on the east setback. So if that's allowed, that would be outlined here, and it is. It's a very applicable bulk regulations, which includes maximum height coverage and minimum yard requirements, and that would be the setback. After which, we have to review uh, state law, which states certain provisions that have to be met or considered when looking at a variance. One of them, and the following five will be outlined here, but number one, that the variance request arises for such condition which is unique to the property in question, which is not ordinarily found in the same zoning district, and is not created by an action or actions of the property owner. So they haven't done anything yet, so this is not something that's been created by them. And so what's unique about it is that they're on a corner lot, and we'll go into this in a little bit more details, but they abut an alley as well. So they're on a corner lot and they abut an alley. And since they're on a corner lot, we require in our subdivision regulations to set properties back 25 feet from the, from the front lot line, six feet on the east side, six feet on the, south, on the west side, 20 on the south side. Well, since they're on a corner lot, we require 15 on the west side, 25 on the north side, six on the east, and 20 on the south. So what's unique about that is that cuts off nine feet on the west side and pushes that everything more center and to the east. And so that's something that's unique to be taken into consideration. Another thing that's somewhat unique about the property is that instead of it being immediately abutting another property, they're abutting an alley. So on the east side, they're actually abutting an alley, and then after the alley, there's the residential properties. On the south of this particular lot, Instead of abutting another residential property like a house, traditionally, it's just a detached garage on a single lot. There's no principal building, it's just a detached garage on the south side. And on the west side is a street, north side is a street. So it's kind of unique in that way is that they're isolated with an alley, a detached garage on the south side, and a street and a street. It's not something that's tucked into a subdivision like you would traditionally see. So that's something that's unique about this particular property. Uh, the granted variance will not adversely affect the rights of adjacent property owners and residents. Uh, like I mentioned, to the east is an alley to the south of the lot with just a garage on it. I don't know when that was built, but apparently there was a garage just sitting there, no house, so I don't know <coughs> somebody. North is a street, and to the west is a street. The strict application of provisions and regulation for which variances which can constitute unnecessary hardship on the property owner requested in the application. As mentioned, it is Kansas, uh, so the weather is inclement. And so the hardship would be that they would, their, um, the vehicles would suffer from the weather and severe weather situations. Um, so that's something just to take into consideration. That the variance desire will not adversely affect public health, safety, morals, order, convenience, prosperity, general welfare, and that the granting the variance desire will not be opposed to the general sphere or intent of these regulations. So it will not affect health, safety, or welfare, generally speaking. And the general intent of these regulations for setback is for purpose of access to easements, predominantly, first and foremost, uh, or public infrastructure or the creation of yards. The property is abutting an alley, and so it's not encroaching on any easement, and the access to the alley is not impeded, and there is no neighbor to the south other than a detached garage. Streets are on the north and the west. Once again, there's the property. So this is what a traditional lot would look like, assuming it was tucked in similar to some of these properties over here. It would have six on the west, for a setback, six on the east, 20 on the south, and 25 on the north. So in this particular case, it pushes it since it's a corner lot, you have 15, 25, six, and 20. And so that's a difference of about nine feet. So that's kind of puts, what do we consider that uh, setback requirements for a corner lot. They have an alley here and a garage here. And so we're just asking that that request be considered. If the car port were to go over, it would go over this east setback and encroach on this on this east setback. Not an easement, but a setback. So there's no utilities or anything in here. All the utilities are in the alley, 
And so if they were to need to get into any of the public infrastructure here, it would not impact that, and there would be no undue hardship given to Public Works Department. Small publication costs per state law, as is required, and legally it's approved as the form. So it is recommended that the Planning Commission approve the setback variance request for the carport encroaching on the east setback for 427 West 3rd Street. I move that they approve the setback variance request for the carport and approach it on the east setback for 427 West 3rd. I'll second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. You guys are welcome to stay if you want. We're free to enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> so, item F3. So, this is what all the hubbub is about, of course. This is ICT development rezoning request, case number zone 21 1. So, quick background, Barbara LLC has submitted a rezoning request on behalf of the developer, Brian Magali for Pritchards, for a proposed development on the corner of 215th and 23rd. The rezoning request would change the zoning classification of the proposed land development from R1 single family residential development to R2 two family development. Purpose of the rezoning land would be to allow duplex to be built within the development without having to go through a conditional use permit for each lot or rezoning a portion of the development. If the Planning Commission approves the rezoning, it would have to then go before the City Council for a final decision. And if it was approved, it would then become official 30 days after publication in the city newspaper actions. Tradition and state law. So this is a continuation of that analysis. This is the 17 items that are required for review, but not necessarily for determining the outcome of the, of the decision by the Planning Commission. It's meant for guidelines. Uh, this comes from the City of Overland Park versus Golden. And basically, these 17 items, purple being my answer, black being the question in from the, from the 17 requirements. So what are the existing uses and their character and condition on the subject property and in the surrounding neighborhood? The land to the east is farming slash ranch operations. I get this from Cedric County LBCS, land-based classification system. To the south, the land use is single family residence, detached. To the west, land use is farming, ranch operation. To the north is farming, ranch land. Uh, there are two schools in close proximity to the east and northeast, and there's a Dillon warehouse to the northwest. What is the current zoning of the subject property and that of the surrounding neighborhood in relation to the request? The land is currently zoned rural residential in the county. Directly east, the zoning is rural residential. Directly north, the zoning is rural residential. Directly south, the zoning is rural residential. And directly west, the zoning is, once again, rural residential. Is the length of time that the subject property has remained undeveloped vacant as a zoned factor in the consideration? No, I don't believe so. The length of time that the land has remained undeveloped was not an over consequence of zoning. I've seen we've seen land being developed regardless of zoning, so I don't think it's I don't think this was zoning consideration would be a restriction on why it has or has not been developed. Would the request correct an error in the application of these regulations? No. Is the re request caused by change or changing conditions in the area of the subject property? So, what is the nature and significance of such change or changing conditions? Absolutely. Yes, the city of Broadway has experienced a large residential increase. Most of this increase is single family detached owner occupied dwellings. There is a need for rental units along with single family detached housing. So, number six do adequate sewer disp uh, disposal and water supply and all other necessary public facilities, including street access, exist or can they be provided to serve the uses and would be permitted on the subject property? Yes, petitions for specials will be submitted per every other standard development that we've seen um, traditionally, and introduction of that would include sewers, water, streets, stormwater, <coughs> similar to any other development in the city. Would the subject property need to be platted or replatted, or in lieu of dedications made for right-of-way easements and access control or building setback lines? Yes, so this is just rezoning. They would still have to go through platting. Um, to, to take into consent reserves, easements, parcel layouts, street layouts, and everything else that would go with it. Would a screening plan be necessary for existing or potential use of subject property? No, adjoining properties are residential or agricultural. The pro proposed use is residential, so it's residential and residential. We only really require screening if it was residential with a budding <coughs> commercial or the proposal was industrial or something other than residential, but this is a residential and residential only. <laughs> is suitable vacant land or buildings available or not available for development as currently has the same zoning as is requested? No, current zoning for R2 is around 81 acres out of approximately 1,946, which accounts for about 4% available land for duplex without having to go through a conditional use permit. And this is one of the reasons why they're asking for that rezoning request, is every time, if there's no rezoning, then they have to go through a conditional use permit for every lot that would have to be proposed for a duplex. And so the rezoning of it allows for that design implementation, also to take into account engineering if they have to move a duplex from one spot to a different spot during the engineering process and before building permits are pulled, they won't have to go through rezoning every single time 
or a conditional use permit every single time. If the request is for business or industrial uses, are such uses needed to provide more services or employment opportunities? This is residential, so 10 does not apply. 11 is a subject property, so there's going to be 17 of these just to keep taking that into consideration. But 11 is a subject property suitable for the uses in the current zoning to which it has been restricted. The current zoning is a zoning classification for the county, so right now it's rural residential, which is specifically for the county. If they are rezoned, if the rezoning is approved by city council after planning commission, it would have to then be annexed, at which point it would default to R1, and so the rezoning would have to be taken into account at that same time, which would be on the 20th if, if it passes planning commission today. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Excuse me, but no comments during, uh, during the presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other further questions, you feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, it would remain R1, but it would require every lot that's proposed a duplex to go through that. Uh, to what extent would the removal of the restrictions, i.e. the approval of the zoning request, detrimentally affect other properties in the neighborhood? Value is a difficult thing to determine. So notice in particular that they're asking about detrimentally affect other properties. This is not talking about quality of life. They're actually specifically highlighting property here. So this is something to take into account. And value, like I said, is difficult to determine. A conversation with Jack Mann, and he's a Central County Residential Land Analyst, has revealed that urban and rural properties appraise differently based on infrastructure that supports these properties. So. Rural properties tend to decline faster simply due to the fact that rural properties are responsible for their own infrastructure that supports these homes versus urban properties that have municipal services. Uh, by this very metric, urban homes with a similar square footage of a rural home are valued slightly higher than their rural counterparts due to the improvements of the urban infrastructure versus the rural infrastructure. Stormwater in Kansas, as is mentioned, everyone's concerned about the stormwater. We are in Kansas. Kansas is very flat. We have a lot of clay. So percolation of water, it doesn't drain very quickly. So stormwater in Kansas is an issue that affects property due to the amount of impervious surface rainwater runoff and the fact that Kansas is flat. Central County has a high clay content under the earth. This issue is handled in the engineering stage of the platting process. So during platting, we require developers to go through engineering to do stormwater runoff coefficients and calculate what is an impervious surface, what is being proposed, and how are you going to handle that stormwater runoff? And all this is done during the de development period, during the engineering process, and during platting. Excuse me. Uh, this issue is handled, like I said, in the engineering stages, determine where it's placed. And that's for retention ponds, capture stormwater, and detain and mitigate rainwater overloading streams, riverbeds, and surrounding properties. So that is all handled during the platting and the engineering process. 13, will the request be consistent with the purpose of zoning district classification and intent and purpose of these regulations? Yes, we're not rezoning it from residential to industrial. It's not being rezoned from residential to commercial. It's being re rezoned from a lower density residential to a higher density residential. It's still residential. Uh, it was a state residential and the city's desire to align more residential development to occur further west outside the rural water district. So we are surrounded by the rural water district number four. To the west, there is no rural water district zone there, so we're allowed to grow that way. I mean, we're allowed to grow into rural water district four as well, but it becomes cumbersome in terms of water rights. And so growing to the west, where there is no rural water district number four, allows us to handle that development easily without having to work with the rural water district in this particular case. Is the request in conformance to the comprehensive plan as a further enhanced implementation of the plan? So yes, according to page 17 of the comprehensive plan, which outlines housing objectives to include, provide for multi-family dwellings retirement housing and other specialized housing as required to meet the needs of defined user groups within the community. What is the nature and support or opposition of the request? So support comes in the request for more single family detached housing to offset demand for housing, as well as desire for more rental properties in Goddard to host those who are either unwilling or unable to purchase a home in the moment. Opposition comes in desire for certain neighborhoods that remain relatively unchanged with the land use composition of single family detached housing or for some communities to continue to cultivate a small town rural experience. And so that's where some of the opposition comes from. Is there any information or are there any recommendations on this request available from professional persons or persons with related experience which would be helpful in this evaluation? So once again, I've, I, I regularly talk with both my colleagues in other cities, other states, in Kansas of course, but in elsewhere and just what is the general planning practice? Obviously, it varies depending on the city. But I also speak with, as mentioned, Jack Mannion, residential land analyst, who is looking at appraisals and assessments and calculations for the county, which incorporates urban and rural developments. And as mentioned, he, this development by itself would be considered its own neighborhood, just like most other urban neighborhoods. So when appraisals and determination is being made for individual properties, especially for everyone behind me, those determinations are made by neighborhoods, and the neighborhood would be first determined if it's rural or urban. 
if it's considered an urban neighborhood, then the ICT development, the one off 250 and 23rd, would be considered one neighborhood. And so what that means is that everyone in the county, in the rural area south of 23rd and the surrounding neighborhood, would be considered a rural neighborhood. And so if a property in the rural neighborhood is being considered for sale and they look out for comparable properties, they're not going to look across the street at ICT development. The county will look into, I mean, the county will look into the surrounding <coughs> rural neighborhood for similar <coughs> comparable properties for making determinations of appraised value. They won't look across the street at an urban property, even if that rural property is a half acre with 1,800 square feet and right across the street is an urban property, 1,800 square feet on a half acre, those are considered two separate distinct neighborhoods and they will not take that into consideration for appraised value and comparable determinations according to the county. So here's the property in, taken into account. Here's 215 and 23rd. Blue is obviously what we're considering for rezoning. On uh, this side over here, we have the development that's sort of a tentative plat. This is not the final plat. We haven't even gone through platting yet. This is just a concept. As you can see here, they're going to, two exits will be off of 215 and one exit would be off of 23rd. There is a small publication cost per state law. Legally, it's approved as the form. It is recommendation that the Planning Commission approve the rezoning request for the ICT development land. At this point, I would invite Chris Baum to come up and speak on behalf of the developer. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Good evening. I'm Chris Baum with Garver, and it's good to see you all here at the meeting tonight. Um, my address is 1995 Midfield Road in Wichita, Kansas. I'm here on behalf of Brian Legally and Kirk Richards of ICT Development to talk about this zone change request. And could we flip back sure. one slide to that aerial Thank photo, you. please? Thank you. Um, we've been talking to the city council several times about infrastructure and how we could get services to this site. Water mains exist that can come down, and there has been a tentative agreement to get some assistance from the city to bring off-site water mains in. If water mains come down, they'll come down from 215th um, west at Kellogg's. It'll serve that next half mile to the north as well. Probably a 12-inch water line that would come down. So the reason that the city would participate in part with those costs is because of the benefit to other properties that could develop over time in this corridor. Uh, secondly, we have talked to the city council about the need for a sanitary sewer lift station at the south end of the property near where the, the swale crosses under 23rd Street on either of the two sides. It would pump back into a sanitary sewer manhole up by the Dillon's distribution site, which is just off the screen to the north. Again, the whole idea here, you've got plant capacity because you've just recently reworked your whole sanitary sewer system and your, your treatment plant. So the idea would be utilizing that infrastructure to allow new development. So during this whole time of, of consideration of this up to today zone change request, we also looked at a tentative layout and you can see that on the right. So that's 202 lots that are indicated there. The open bigger spaces, the triangles and the reserves are quite literally set aside for detention ponds. Again, that would handle the stormwater control. It's not designed yet. It's just a layout of what we plan on. It's the spirit of the layout. So there, there were comments tonight about drainage across 215th and drainage across 23rd in large flood events. The whole idea of detention storage is that you look at the impact of the increased development and increased impervious area on a subdivision. You size ponds and outlet structures such that it will hold the difference in the runoff and release it over an extended period of time, not increasing the net runoff for any series of storms from the site. That is part of the platting process, but I just wanted to mention it tonight. It is something that has to be done. If those ponds have to be bigger, they have to be bigger. So it's just a part of the subdivision process. But I wanted to mention it tonight since it came up in the discussion. Um, we talked about schools. Um, you know, in doing this layout and talking to the developers, we looked at the access to the trail to the north. And similarly, we actually talked about the possibility if the neighboring property would be in agreement to make walkways over to the school system. So the whole idea would be to try to create 
a system where kids don't have to go out on arterial streets to get to school. That there would be interior sidewalks and circulation that would allow it. Now, I can't sit here tonight and guarantee that that property owner to the east, where you can see that orange gap and then the cyan line, would allow a walkway over to the schools, but I know that ICT development has been in communication with that owner, and we would most certainly like that because that would aid in the safety of the neighborhood. Similarly, with the trail to the north, the bike trail, um, the whole idea would be we provide access to the north out of the two cul-de-sacs so you could have pedestrian access or bicycle access to the trail. So if you could follow that line of logic, that would be pretty easy to come up over on the trail and then drop into the school sites. So the whole idea would be to create something that's safe, for, especially for kids getting to school, that doesn't necessarily involve buses or, or, or parents driving the kids to school. Um, did you happen to have those slides of the properties that I sent today in the form of a PDF? Uh, no, I didn't bring them. Up. Okay. But okay. Well, that's all right. Yeah. The proposed development tonight would consist of 60% single-family homes and 40% duplexes. Single-family homes would buffer the whole perimeter of the site, and then duplex would be tucked in interior to the site and utilized for uh, pockets that just provide a mix of a market product for the area. The single-family <coughs> homes, um, again, would be around the perimeter. The whole idea there would be to allow um, folks to buy a single-family home. And in many cases, the people who rent the duplex homes in an area like this are the ones who end up buying a home in the single-family area. So with me tonight is Brian Legawi. And Brian, if you wanted to get up and say anything about the, the types of homes that you think that you might build in there and what kind of investment that you'd be making into this neighborhood, I think that would be of value. <coughs> Hello, uh, Brian Legawi, uh, 1517 Obsidian Court, Wichita. Um, Kirk Richards and I are looking at doing this development together. We're planning on just trying to get start out get some affordable housing and then it, it will we'll have a wide range of price ranges in there we're looking at between a thousand square feet to 1800 square feet um, you're probably looking at uh, 200,000 to 400,000 dollar price range um, they're not low income there's not HUD housing there's nothing like that um, if you see the pictures that we had uh, they're they're nice the duplexes the houses um, will work well together um, uh, we put fence yards in on the houses and on the uh, duplexes. They'll have uh, private fenced in yards, sprinkler systems, <coughs> excuse me, um, landscaping, the mowing and all the maintenance, outside maintenance and everything will be taken care of by the association. Um, so that is all done together. So it's all mowed at the same time, fertilized, taken care of, watered all together. Uh, that is an expense that we incur and is part of the the uh, the rent. Um, we'll sell some of them. Uh, they're going to they will, the duplex half of the duplex will sell at around one hundred and eighty thousand up. Um, the rents will be uh, about twelve hundred dollars to eighteen hundred dollars, kind of in that range. Um, let's see what else. We're also putting in some parks and some recreation areas in the neighborhood to some playground equipment, that kind of thing. Um, we're gonna do some uh, bike paths inside of our neighborhood as well. And uh, and Brian, I shared with them, the I printed some of those handouts, and here it is, if you wanna walk them through, this is page one. Uh, some yeah, of the single family homes. These are kind of the, the homes we're planning on building. They'll start out, like I say, they'll start out about a thousand square feet, and we'll intermix. We picture as we get to the north, that the houses will probably be a little bit higher end at the further north we go toward the uh, train track it's just a, a nice drawing point there for the track we're also looking at doing some a small cluster of uh, geared toward the retirement community um, there'll be small two-bedroom duplexes um, uh, geared toward the 55 and over is what we're looking for on those so we're going to have a bunch of different price range of different types to kind of cover all the needs. Second page is more of some of the duplex models. 
those are some duplexes we just finished up um, over at 119th and uh, 29th Street. Um, they're selling uh, the whole building. They're selling for uh, right at 340 to 350 uh, per building. And uh, we did the same thing there. We have fenced in yards, landscaping, sprinklers, all the yard maintenance, everything's taken care of. And then some more duplexes and on the third sheet, there's another kind of a, a different kind of a variant under construction that you can see on that last sheet. A little different architectural style under construction. The houses would be real similar to like um, the Seasons and then St. Andrews, the kind of starting out at that range and then going up from there. Are you, are you going to specify the lots or you, is it going to be up to the person who wants to purchase what size house they build? Uh, yeah, it, it just depends on what, what the market so bears at the time. Yeah, okay. yeah. But the duplexes and, are set? The lot, those lots are set? Um, per, pretty much. It just depends on how that ends up changing. Right, but for the most part, you're going to yeah. put the duplexes where you Yeah, they're all going to be interior. We're going to have them all buffered from, with single-family houses. Um, Kirk and I will be doing all the building out there, the two of us. Um, so we're kind of on the same page all the way through. We work together on that to kind of keep it consistent. And you know, you don't want to, you know, you're not going to build a $500,000 house next to a, a $200,000 house, but you know, it's slowly going to transition as we go through the development. Okay. And you did say you have a homeowners association? Yes. Single family is going to start about 2000 or 200000 <coughs> They'll start, yeah, we're, uh, we're shooting, we're going to try to get them in there around 175 is what we're going to shoot for. We'd really like to get them down there for, for a good starter house for somebody. It's just hard to do right now with everything the way it is. Michael, hmm. let's say we, if this goes zoned R2, R2, and my understanding is that it's a convenience so that down the road, they don't have to do the CUP for each individual lot. Right. I'm not saying this is going to happen at all, but what would happen if, let's say, they somehow ICT development just fell through and somebody else purchased this, the property? Mm -hmm. Is there anything preventing them from building all R2 except mm -hmm. the process of going through the planning commission? Once it's zoned R2, it's zoned R2. So anybody, hypothetically, if Brian <coughs> fell through for whatever reason somebody else came up and purchased it from them they could all take it all the duplexes yeah <coughs> what has been I you, you, you mentioned there's been conversation you know we talked about schools and the, um, the water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, what about the, the traffic and the safety concerns on the, the streets? Um, have you spoken with the county, the city? How are, is traffic going to be addressed? I know it'll be a traffic design study, but. Right, and that comes in the subdivision phase. So we haven't gotten to that point yet. We're still trying to work through the zoning, but. What happens if the county comes back and says we're not doing anything to the roads if everything's fine the way it is? Well, the you the city of Goddard through the subdivision process would have the right to ask for certain improvements. Like if you wanted a decel lane into an area or a left turn lane into an area, that's part of the platting and a traffic study could analyze that and make that kind of determination. However, anything off-site would be if if there's an issue at 215th and Kellogg, that's not an issue with this development. Right. Development issues would be at the entrances of this of this facility. Um, the road on 215th, it sounds like that's the jurisdiction of, of Goddard, and it sounds like the township is in charge of 23rd. I don't know, upon annexation, <coughs> if what limits of streets the city would choose to take on as part of that annexation. That would be a question for city council, I guess, and uh, Goddard law. But if the city did annex the street 23rd is with the annexation of the site, it would become the responsibility of Goddard. So again, any of those comments at entrances and such for traffic would be part of the subdivision process, which we're not, we're not there yet. Like the conversation that we had 
that the north half of 23rd would be maintained by guard, the south half would be maintained by the township or the county? Yeah, traditionally when we annex land, we annex half the road. Um, so we would annex the north part of 23rd and we would annex the east part of 215 um, going up to the, to the trail, to the Brain Travelers Trail. That's typical when we do our annexation. And so when we, if the zoning were to go through and we annex the property, we would consider annexing that strip of the road on the north side, north part of 23rd and the east part of 215. And that's pretty traditional. If we wanted to annex more, we could, it would be within our purview. Um, it would have to go before city council as part of the annexation agreement that we're annexing the whole street, not just half of it. And so that would be something that city council would have to take into account. But then if there was hypothetically a pothole on the north part of 23rd, then the city would be responsible for it, not the township. Curiosity, uh, what difference does it make if you have your high end <coughs> to the north rather than to the south? Uh, what, what's the it's just how we envision it. It just, um, the ground appears to us to be a little more valuable to the north toward the tracks, toward the amenity of the, the walking paths and stuff. I think that's a good sales point of that, and I think that would draw a little bit higher end. I guess I, my, my comment to that would be if your high end <coughs> stuff was to the south and to the west, it would accommodate some of the wishes of the people that are here rather than having the lower end to the south, the butts 23rd, and just depending on anything else. Well, in, in regard to that point about the mix, and that was a good point about the zoning, we're happy to offer a protective overlay that says 60% is single family, 40% is duplex as part of the, the resolution to zone the property. If you want a guarantee of that, make it a requirement. My concern wasn't with you guys. It was, I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Well, that would run with the case. If you did a protective overlay that said 60% single family, 40%, and no more, that that would solve that problem for this development or any future owner of the property so we would offer that 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 would carry on but ryan what do you think it's probably true so that would be something that could be taken into consideration mm -hmm. ryan. That, that's not part of the zoning that would have to be something no i don't ryan do you want to comment on that legally speaking i don't know about protective overlays carrying with the property on a zoning classification? That I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. But certainly it's something that we can push for with regard to the planning. Yeah. Process. Maybe in the planning process we can consider restrictive covenants in that regard as so. part of a legal description, as part of the requirements during the planning process. Um, Couldn't you do it as a deed restriction? And just make it as part of the deed. It'd be just a restriction on the deed. We've typically done them as protective overlays that is part of the zone change case. So it, it lays out that stipulation. Much like if you have requirements for fencing or if the planning commission said we want certain kind of lights in this neighborhood or what have you, you have that jurisdiction to make those, you know, make those uh, actions of the zone change case. Fencing in the case of residential to commercial or residential to industrial, you have that capability of doing it. Protective overlay in this case would just say it's uh, limited to a maximum of 40% of the lots that are platted would, can be duplex and no more. We offer that in whatever legal mechanical way that you could create it. Thank you for your consideration. We've been at this some months to try to work through the, the intricacies of this, so we do appreciate you hearing us tonight. We hope that you'll you'll vote favorably on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd have to look at the legal qualifications of a protective overlay, but in theory, if it worked in Wichita, there's a good chance it would work here. Which would be better than doing it in planning because they can always replot it. They could always rezone it too. So uh, there's a lot that could go into that, but I mean, if nothing else, it would just provide another hurdle. If 
planning commission and city council felt like that would be a good provision to adopt as part of the rezoning then it certainly would put the bar higher for someone down the road hypothetically if the development were to fail uh, that would just be another hurdle they would have to jump through for a future developer in the case of a hypothetical situation so um, like I said I would have to just check the legal on that outside but if you wanted to consider that as part of the approval process feel free and we will also provide present that to City Council I thought of one more question, gentlemen. I'm sorry. Do you, have, do you have any plans for a common area park or anything like that? Yes. Okay. There's going to be a couple, couple small parks and uh, recreation areas. In there. Okay. Thank you. So it is recommended that the Planning Commission approve the rezoning request for the ICT development land. You would, depending on your recommendation, you would make a recommendation if, hypothetically, if it was to approve, then it would be, you know, we make a motion to approve the rezoning request for the ICT development land contingent upon the legal consideration of a protective overlay to be presented to City Council who has final authority on the rezoning request. But at the end of the day, you guys are only making a recommendation to the City Council. <coughs> and ultimately, it's going to be the City Council who makes any Binding decision, so we understand that, right? All so well, <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I think you know if we hear from you that you know you're you're recommending this, you know, subject <coughs> to eligibility of a protective overlay, we can get working on that and and try and flesh out that issue <coughs> before this comes before the city council. Discussion happens at the bench when you're ready for a motion. You make a motion in a second, yes. and then you uh, move forward. Next agenda item. I think my big concern is traffic. That that's right there. there. I mean, I, I believe that the water issue can probably be alleviated with design, plat, you know, with the engineering. But the traffic is a concern for me too. And I understand that there's not only the the neighborhood, but with what we're hearing from the Dillon's activity with the semi and the big trucks that's blocking the intersection access to Kellogg. I think there's more of an issue here than just on E. Yep. Amen. 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 I, I have a concern too with the, if the R2 would be you know, able to access that Normal process for R2 is cumbersome. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the normal process is cumbersome. It's just that if, we, if they have to do a CUP for every duplex, 
that's going to everyone has to come in. That's a big forty percent of the lot. But then that's a to me that's a city guard. If we want to make the process easier, let's make the process easier. That's what they're doing by trying to rezone the dark too. This makes the whole process easier. I, I can see this as a workaround for one one thing. You know, when it's Correct. not an ongoing, not a permanent solution to the R2 CP problem. That's just my thought. I guess I don't see the problem. I'm not understanding. No, because for this one, we're having to say, okay, okay, we're going to, you know, it's, well, theoretically, if the 60-40 uh, thing doesn't go through, theoretically, if this goes through, it could be wrong R2. Correct. Come in. That's that, that is, yes, that's, that's a risk we can take by approving it to R2. Right. And, and the only guarantee that you have on that is an overlay that says 100%. And, and that would. And that's out of our control. We maintain the control if it stays in our one. And then each law individually is. I know that's what they're trying to do with mm -hmm. Trying to make it convenient. But it'd be. 80 applications if you wanted to put in you know 40 percent duplexes you'd have that many applications but the thing would stay in our one and we'd be able to control that if it's hard for them to get r2 within that then i think that's a, probably the safe guard needs to look at it they could maybe change those zoning regulations to see if maybe you can zone a certain percentage of I think this will work out. This is the same thing we did for both. They have to apply to rezone it and rezone it individually. <laughs> and you have to rezone it before they can apply it. So. Right. Um, I don't know if it's a win win situation. I guess I just don't understand if we're, we're going to entertain the idea of doing a, a CUP on every single lot. What's the difference between that and an R2 approval of the overlay? The overlay seems to be the, the crux of the matter. If, if an overlay can be set in stone, right? I agree with that. If it can't, then, then we need to do individual. Because we all know that every company in the in the country can go broke tomorrow, mm -hmm. and if this is rezoned as R2, and, I agree. and the old lady's not there, then. But we also have control of the plat, too. Whether it's whether we have an overlay or not, we get to see the plat, right? All preliminary and final plats go before planning commission. <coughs> so it's twofold with an overlay and a plat approval. I agree. <laughs> we're trying to rush. I'm just trying to look through all the. Right. <laughs> because we have several steps, even if we rezone it, we still have we still have control. Okay. And this is, and really, it's not even set in stone. It goes from us to the city council as the ultimate decision. Really, we, we've seen that. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, the issue before us tonight is the rezoning. Yes. All of the other stuff is is it raised after the issue tonight is only rezoning. Correct. So I'll make a motion that we approve the rezoning of R2 based upon uh, an overlay for the 6040. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Nay. 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 I need to abstain. You want to abstain? So I got no, no, abstain, yes, no, no, and yes. Motion fails. Okay. Can I say something? You may. I, I don't oppose a motion as per the uh, the 6040 you know 
R2, R1. My only objection to, to, to developing this as an R2 is there's not, I don't feel like there's adequate safety on, on the 215th, and I don't know that we have a, a plan in place or have an idea how we can maintain those roads safely yet. I mean, if this was going to go through, you know, I mean, I know that's a whole different situation, different subject. I know it would just be adding to the issue. Do you want to propose a separate motion or do you want to just consider? <laughs> I don't want to motion to propose it here. You're making a contingent upon restructuring to continue to go to the third. That's all going to be under the It's a whole other deal. It is a whole other deal. But it's like you say, that's the crux of it, is if all of this is developed and you can't get from 215th to Walnut in less than an hour, <laughs> and, and the pothole becomes, it can't become bigger. <laughs> <laughs> No, if, if, and if Goddard City can annex the whole road, <coughs> and I, I agree that, that that's, that's probably the issue. Now, whether the developer wants to pony up to part of the road problem, maybe that's the answer. Yes. Yeah. How far over the edge you might be pretty, cool, pretty close. I, I mean, that would have to be separate consideration. Um, at this point, the motion fails. I think we'll move on to item F.4. Final consideration for rezoning of ICT development goes before City Council at this point. So, <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Item F.4, this is a conditional use permit for an accessory apartment in the county. Uh, this is case number CLN 2021-0051. Uh, quick background, uh, the city receives notification of zoning changes, conditional use permits, CUP, and other developments outside of city limits if it is in the city's area of influence. This is to notify the city requests comments on these projects to be courteous to the city's growth and inevitable annexation of those properties. This is a formality and those developments can be approved without the consent of the City of Goddard Planning Commission. However, these projects can trigger a supermajority from the Board of County Commissioners if the local Planning Commission decides to vote against the proposed development. Uh, so quick analysis, the property location is tax parcel ID 30011581, generally located about 1,200 feet north of US 54 on the east side of 231st. The city considers conditional use permits for items inside of their zone of influence. Uh, this is for an accessory apartment on rural residential lot. The apartment is for the owner's father. The Metropolitan Area Planning Department will receive and file the comments and vote of the local municipal planning commission. The final vote will be the Board of County Commissioners. Um, so at this point, I'll invite MAPD. Matt Williams here is representing Center County, Wichita, MAPD. And if you do have any questions, feel free to ask directly. Yeah, good evening. If you desire, it's a little sweaty. Okay. Um, yeah, Micah went through most of everything. Uh, this is an accessory apartment uh, located south of 231st Street West and a quarter mile north of West Kellogg. Uh, the applicant says that they're, uh, they intend for this to be for a family member. Uh, the accessory apartment will be behind their primary structure um, located uh, with an attached garage. Uh, properties around the site are primarily agriculture land. There is a single family house to the north of this and to the west across the street. Um, planning staff is recommending that the request be approved subject to the supplementary use regulations in our zoning code. Um, I haven't heard any concerns about this case from anybody. Uh, we also, uh, your, your recommendation will be given to the Planning Commission, and uh, the Planning Commission actually deferred this case two weeks ago, and they're going to be hearing it this Thursday to wait for your comments. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you have photos on there or anything? Thank you, Don. Okay, yeah, we do have photos. So. The site up there is with a star. Um, you can see the site plan there on the right side. Um, uh, the site plan is rotated, so the north is going to be on the right side. So the primary structure will be located closer to the road. Um, 
the large structure. Uh, kind of behind that is a garage with the accessory living unit attached. Can you answer any questions? Well, we see, you know, it, it's a residential use. Uh, our supplementary use regulations require this uh, to be owned by the same owner, so it can't be sold off separately. Um, it's going to go with the land. Uh, we don't see this as having a big impact on uh, neighbors across the street or adjacent to this, um, because you know there is a, a single-family house to the north. And this is going to be behind the property or behind the primary residence so we don't think there will be a large impact on any of the neighboring residences and it looks like access is from the same their existing access yep off of 231st street i believe Uh, it, where the star is the, the property outlined with the white box that it has not been developed yet but there is an existing residence just north of it and across the street to the west questions for them I apologize I saw you guys had some questions I am the property owner if there's any questions that you have Name basically address please sir uh, currently it is at 552 East Martins here in Goddard um, William Best is my name uh, so yes I initially when I bought the property a little over a year ago I planned on building my home and then having a detached garage with living quarters in it and then uh, last year, or a little over a year ago, my mother passed away. My father decided he did not want to main or keep the house that he's in and started looking for another house to, to build or move into. Couldn't find anything that he really liked, so then I told him that I would allow him to live in. The, we'd, I was actually going to make it into a detached garage with what they call like a, a party barn. So uh, instead of that, went to an alternate plan. Uh, to allow my father to live there so I can keep an eye on him. He's 82 years old now and just wanted to keep him close to me. So uh, I have no intentions of renting out to an, as an apartment or anything like that. Just my property. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Financially, all costs are at the expense of Metropolitan Area Planning Department since this is in the county. Uh, legal, all legal considerations must be abided by the Metropolitan Area Planning Department once again because final authority goes before the Board of County Commissioners. It is recommended that the Planning Commission direct MEPD staff accordingly.
<laughs> Either an affirmative or a denial or do we buy into this or not? So is that a motion a motion that we affirm? Yeah. Is a uh, motion to approve the, the yes. accessory appointment? The accessory Okay. I'll second. Aye. Very good. Motion passes. All right. Well, you're welcome to stay. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Take your leave. Old business, there are none. New business, so this is item H. Item H1, this is the preliminary plat for Tanganyika Wildlife Park Edition. Uh, so quick background, Boffin Company PA submitted a plenary plat on behalf of the developer Jim Fouts. This plat is for the Tanganyika Wildlife Park Edition, which sits on land that was swapped to the city in 2019. This part is part of, excuse me, this plat is part of a greater process to rezone land as a plan needed to develop PUD. It constitutes part two of four to accomplish this rezoning process. The Planning Commission approved the process to rezone this land to a PUD on 12-9-2019. Cladding of a new land typically requires a stormwater drainage plan and city engineers working with Boffman and engineering development to meet these stormwater drainage requirements. Stormwater engineering might require modifications to the final plat, which would be approved by the city council. Planning Commission can approve the plats contingent upon final engineering review and any necessary modifications done to the final plat for stormwater requirements. Uh, Planning Commission, once again, is considering approving a preliminary plat for the Tanganyika Wildlife Park. The plat is for one commercial lot, gross acres 27, area proposed zoning PUD, step two or four, and final engineering for the drainage and all unnecessary factors for building placement and attention requirements will have to be met before building permits can be pulled for this development. So um, as you're aware, the PUD is, is really a broad open design process, and so that's why we have multiple steps, four steps in total. First is the concept, then the preliminary plat, then the final plat, and then the final concept design. And the final concept design has the layout of the buildings, the square footage, and everything else that goes into it. So right now, what they're just asking for is the preliminary and the final, and the final will be item H.2. Um, so at this point right now, they're just looking at getting the land platted, and then the final concept design will go over the top of it, showing the layout of all the buildings. They're not asking for any uh, additional easements. Uh, most of the development will be, in fact, pretty much all of it's gonna be privately developed. So of course, they'll still have to go through a review through the city for engineering purposes, but they're not asking for any public lateral mains to go inside this development. It's all gonna be private development, privately financed. So the plat which is in your agenda packet, this is the preliminary. Financially, none. Platting is required any type of publication or anything else that would go into it. Legally, it's approved as the form. Uh, it is recommended the Planning Commission approve the preliminary plat for the taking of wildlife park addition. Contingent upon final engineer review for necessary stormwater drainage requirements and modifications. At this point, I will invite Thomas Joyce, Governor's <coughs> Boffman, who represents the developer, to come up and speak on the matter if you do have any questions at all. So, Thomas, at this point. Would you prefer to slide? Uh, this one. Perfect. Um, yeah, so like Mike said, my name is Thomas Joyce, address 130 South Decker Street, Wichita. Um, here representing Bachman Company on behalf of our applicant, Jim Fouts. Um, so open up to any questions you guys have. Thank you. This is, my, this is my very first planning commission, so <laughs> let's keep it all like this, yeah. huh? See you, Harlan. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that's all that we need. Thank okay. you very much. You guys look so easy on them, I can't believe it. Uh. <laughs> all right. So at this point, it's recommended that the Planning Commission approve the preliminary plat for taking a wildlife park addition, contingent upon final engineering review for necessary stormwater drainage requirements and modifications. I'll make a motion to recommend that approval of preliminary plat for taking a wildlife park addition, contingent upon final engineering review for necessary stormwater drainage requirements and modifications. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. 
Item H2 is more of the same, so this will be the final plat. So as you know, Goddard doesn't have any one-step final platting process, so every plat has to be a preliminary and a final. <coughs> so if everything is as it should be, then we have the preliminary and then the final, and then the final plat goes before City Council, and that's for the final decision of City Council. So once again, Bachman Company, so most of this is all the same. Planning Commission can approve plats contingent upon final engineering review and any necessary modifications on the final plat for stormwater requirements. Generally the same. Final plat. As you can see, there's a whole lot less on a final plat simply for recording purposes. The county generally doesn't care about contours, not to say that they don't care entirely, it's just they don't want to see it during the recording process. So we have generally as clean as possible for legal reasons and also the help with, uh, with the development process. But Financially none, legally approved as a form. It's recommended the Planning Commission approve the final plan for the Tangany Wildlife Park addition condition upon final engineering review for necessary stormwater drainage requirements and modifications. And if you do have any more questions for Tom, he's still here, first time, so feel free to harangue him if necessary. I'll make a motion to approve the final plan for Tangany Wildlife Park addition contingent upon the final engineering review for necessary stormwater drainage requirements and modifications. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thomas, at this point, you can stay if you want. <laughs> very vivacious. <laughs> 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 sure you don't want to join the public sector. Um, so this is item I, staff report. So <clears throat> I won. This is the year 2021 in review. So we had single family building mm -hmm. permits. We had 60. So we so far we've met the same as last year. Last year we had 60 single family. We have 60 so far to date. So hopefully if we get a little bit more, we'll just tip over from last year. We'll be ahead of schedule. Uh, multifamily, we've had six. Commercial, we had four. Total value, 18 million for a single family, 1.6 million for multifamily, 9.1 million for commercial. Assessed value, total cut tax collection, once it goes through the county. Mm -hmm. So meetings, we've had 12. We met uh, consistently every single month, which I'm grateful for, and I appreciate everybody's time. Four conditional use permits, one variance, eight plats. If, of course, we had a preliminary and final, so there's that. Uh, rezoning two, subdivision changes six, site plans three, one special use, and eight other. And item I point to, Doug Van Amberg is retiring. So after many years of dedicated service to the city of Goddard, Doug Van Amberg has decided to step down and spend more time with his family and pursue other hobbies like horse riding and cars. Chair Doug Van Amberg has served on the Planning Commission faithfully since 1992, a total of 29 years, and has lived in Goddard and Central County for over 33 years. Mr. Van Amberg's contribution to the city is unquantifiable, and the city is indebted to his perseverance and commitment in serving the city of Goddard for as long as he has. City of Goddard would like to thank Mr. Van Amberg for his time and service in helping grow the city to become what it is today. City hopes to continue to build the city, make it a desirable place for families to locate for many years to come, fostering the spirit of a healthy, vibrant, and active community. At this point, I would like everyone to join me in congratulating Mr. Van Amberg. Thank all of you, and, and this is something that, brief history lesson, George Proctor was the mayor, and he also built our house, and he said, I've got a job for you, he says, there's nothing to it, you don't have to do it for very long, and here we are. Very good. This this has been a pleasure, It's it's been important to me for the people out here, and that we look to the city and that we have a better place to live. Uh, we, we have our agreements and disagreements about signs and tent buildings and, <laughs> and all of that, but we're all going, I think, the right direction. And I'm glad to be a part of that. Well, thank I'll you very much. <laughs> I want to encourage the Planning Commission and anybody else to um, join us on the 20th when we continue to celebrate the accomplishments of Mr. Doug Van Amberg. So thank you very much. At this point, item J, Planning Commissioner comments. No comment. <laughs> In order you, I've got to bring up 10 buildings and signs. 
at least six times a year. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Item K, this will be adjournment. It's the next regular planning commission meeting will be January 10th, 2022. Make a motion we adjourn. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.